You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Jared Mounts with Jake's Bait and Tackle. It's been a while since we've been we've been back together. Yeah. It feels like forever. We had a couple of great conversations. One that's probably already dropped was the Sikorsky one, where we went for like three hours talking yeah. about the Chesapeake. In the live stream, yeah. And that was awesome. And Jeff Little. Jeff which, Little was really amazing to me. Like, uh, yeah. I always knew that he was a good smallmouth angler and good for the industry but um what i love about you know these podcasts and live streams you really get into the backstory of people and get to know them more and just their passion for fishing and their passion for helping others be able to catch fish and you know i think that is kind of the point of all this to get out information and knowledge to help people catch fish more fish bigger fish what's interesting to me was like the pesticide thing mm-hmm. i cannot believe and he actually i think he dropped that video already of them actually yeah. dumping pesticide in the susquehanna the i was yeah. flabbergasted that that's yeah, actually to kill thing. bugs or something i've never like, heard of that before. craziness i mean decisions that they make sometimes are not good that's the other thing too from this is just you know we have to take care of the resource you know mm-hmm. we enjoy fishing we got to take care of the fish we got to take care of the resource the water and you know with dave same thing david i mean it's just there's there's so much information out there that we've got to be not just advocates but we've got to do our part physically do our part to make sure uh that this fishery is still around for future generations no 100 percent. like and that's like the biggest reason like i started this thing was like to be an advocate for the area and just mm-hmm. give a voice to like the common folk mm-hmm. um because that was the craziest thing when we started this was how much of a disconnect there is from mm-hmm. the gov from the local governments mm-hmm. who they're not evil. They're trying right. the best, but there is a lack of communication between them and a Jeff Little, the guy that just mm-hmm. fishes every day. Right. And I think that's something that hopefully that we're going to expose mm-hmm. and being able to to help mend those mm-hmm. paths. Mm-hmm. But today we got another great episode here. Yes. Who do we got here? Speaking of which, so this uh, Lonnie Connor, sixty two years old, he just told wow. us, and he he was introduced to the river at age five. So do the math there. He's he's tenured. <laughs> he's experienced. On the river, uh, Lonnie, we, we got to thank him for his service to the Strasburg Police Department, I believe it is. Um, how many years there? Uh, 17 and a half years there. 17 and a half years there. And that, as everybody knows, that's not an easy job either. And uh, so he was well respected in that area. Um, they had a video about out there about him uh, leaving. And I tell you, I, I, I honest to God shed a tear watching that. Yeah, um, that was, that was, a that was emotional. Yes. Um, and so that just goes to show too, what kind of guy this is, mm-hmm. um, many years ago, gosh, I mean, Jake's, we celebrating 10 years this year. So, uh, we, we were doing a lot of, uh, seminars and, and Lonnie was one that came in early on, uh, before this building even existed. Um, came in and did a river seminar for us. So, um, yeah, I'm, he's he's a local guy, a uh, river guy, and uh, excited to hear what he has to say today and, and tips that he can give. So, Lonnie, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Yes, uh, I, uh, I've i been fishing, I guess, well, like I said, since I was five. And uh, in the early 80s, I, I met a guy, uh, of course, two good friends, and uh, he said, hey, you want to you wanna fly fish want to learn how to fly fish i said sure you know and and you know growing up you you, you don't ever fish you know s- for specific species you know so i thought yeah i'd love to try it so i started fly fishing and i became obsessed you know so you know i i fly fished in new york i fly fished in tennessee i fly fished uh Blue Ridge Parkway, Skyline Drive, Mossy Creek, Jackson River, all of them, you know. And I started tying flies. And uh, so during that time, uh, an old guy came up to me and he said, hey, you want to go bass fishing? I thought, sure, why not? So he took me on his uh, boat and uh, I never I never could use a bait caster, mm-hmm. you know, always the fairy one. But anyhow, <laughs> uh so he, he taught me how to use a bait caster. And uh, I remember the first five pound I ever caught was a Chickahominy mm. in a, one of the creeks down close to the mouth. And I was hooked. I caught on mm. a buzz bait. And that was in the early 80s. Mm. So fly fishing kind of went to the wayside. Mm-hmm. I would still fly fish, but the bass fishing, I, I became obsessed with that. I took over. 
So I, I started, and he asked me if I wanted to fish tournaments. And I said, well, I've never done it, but I, I'd like to do it. So uh, I fished tournaments with him, and then uh, I fished some Red Man tournaments, and I fished Federation. And how old were you at this point? I was in my early tournaments? 20s. Okay. I was probably 20, 25, 26. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it just, it, it, I got really obsessed and I would read everything I could find. I would read. I, I was just like a sponge, you know. And uh, I mean, I was down to like pH in the water, pH balance. You know, I know that wow. water at its heaviest density was like 39.2. So I, stratification. Wow. Like, so I was obsessed. And I, there was not a article that came out that I wouldn't read, you know. And uh, I would fish two, three, four days a week. Every chance I got to be on the water, that's uh -huh. what I did. Hmm. So over the years, you know, I kept fishing and I, I would do tournaments and then it got to the point where uh, I decided to just do the local club tournaments, mm -hmm. you know, I did, and not get into it big time. Uh, but that, so I spent a lot of time on the river. Now I fished uh, from New Market on the North Fork, from New Market all the way to Front Royal in sections, mm -hmm. and the South Fork uh, I fished all the way from, I guess, uh, up Bentonville, all the way down to Watermelon Park in section. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I fished Shenandoah, and and down. Mm -hmm. Used to be a place called Dam Acres. Mm. And that was a uh, old farm where you could go in there and camp, and you could actually put a boat in and fish that section mm -hmm. of the river. Uh, and you're talking about the town of Shenandoah, yes, the Shenandoah River in the town of Shenandoah. Yes, and that's the other quick thing too. Like when you look at the map behind you, like you know, he always talked about the amount of water in our region. You know, tri-state, four-state mm -hmm. area, and like, and even now, like people that I know that in the, like that, I've grown up in this area, and we you fish certain sections, but. There's a lot of people out there that still don't know. I've heard some of our customers talking about they want to go down to Shenandoah, right. the town of Shenandoah, and fish the Shenandoah River. So, and and you could put a bass boat in there, and but it it's not a very long section, but uh, it I've seen some nice bass mm -hmm. come out of there, you know. But uh, uh, again, I I spent most of my time on the rivers, you know, mm -hmm. here locally, and uh, but when I when I was in this bass club. They they did uh, they would go around and do demonstrations. So it was in Chantilly, hmm. and they asked me if I would do a fly fishing demonstration. Mm -hmm. I said sure, and uh, so I did it. And afterwards, a guy came up to me and asked me if I was interested in being a guide in Colorado, fly fishing guide. He had a hunting business, and he wanted his clients. He wanted to be able mm -hmm. to do that on the side, you know. And of course, I was just uh, getting ready to get married, so finances and stuff and. I declined, uh, but you know it, it. It was nice to have the offer, and then of course I went towards the bass fishing, bass fishing side, and, and I've stuck with that, mm -hmm. you know. And then later, later on, uh, as you guys know, I started a business making bass fishing mm -hmm. lures. Mm -hmm. So, and, and to me. The, the reason I started doing that was like, you know, instead of buying them, I'll just make them. Right. You know, cheaper. Well, when you start making them, and then, you know, your friends say, hey, man, I'll, I'll buy some of them. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't really want to sell them, but I'll give you some, mm -hmm. you know. And it just kept on and on. And finally, uh, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to start selling them. And, but it, it was, to me, it was a, a sense of pride to make sure that those baits were mm -hmm. really, really good. So, mm -hmm. you know, I knew that Yamamoto mm -hmm. stick baits mm -hmm. were, everybody bought them. Right. And I, I had this big aquarium with a bass in it. And I would put baits in it and watch his reaction, you know. And Yamamoto, the, the action to him was just, it, it just, I don't know, you know, it's just the plastic they used. And how they how they make the baits, but anyhow, you think it's the action of that. And the only reason yes. I say that, I had a customer yesterday was asking about the the stick bait and wacky, and mm -hmm. just you know it was kind of new to him. And so I took him around to show him the different brands, and I said, of course, Gary Yamamoto, you know his plastics, and I don't know if it's 
and you say action, you know, I always thought too, when they grab onto it, the softness or the salt, yeah. something about, or something about that bait, they don't spit it, but it's, it's good to hear you say the action of that yes, bait. Yes, action, you know, <clears throat> bass, they had their lateral line, so they, mm -hmm. they feel the vibration, you know, so the action of a Yamamoto bait is, and, I, and I'm not sponsored by right. any means, but uh, it's just, it's totally different. So uh -huh. my, when I started making stick baits, I wanted to match that. So it was uh, down to the point where I actually weighed Yamamoto baits. Huh. And I tried to produce the same weight. And yeah. I was able to get added this to make it sink. So, so if you put salt in plastisol, it doesn't really dissolve. So you, you ever take a tube and kind of like push on it and see the salt? Put, right. Well, there's different consistencies of salt. You got like uh, rock, you know, big chunk, mm -hmm. and you got powder. But the more salt you add to a bait, the harder it gets. It makes the plastic hard. So you, there's a fine line. Gotcha. But there's an additive you could get that would make it sink. But it also gave it that real mm. soft, and it hmm. made the action. Hmm. And they were really good. You know, my the baits I made, a lot of guys won a lot of money off from them. You know, but uh, that, that was me being meticulous. And I had mm. a, a book of recipes. Mm -hmm. so every bait i made i had a recipe for the color the flake mm -hmm. and the amount of salt and all that so mm -hmm. i did that for a few years and it got and and uh it got to the point where i wasn't able to fish mm -hmm. i was just constantly making baits mm -hmm. and i couldn't keep up and uh so i said you know what i love to fish and I'm, I'm not getting that so i sold my business connor's custom baits yes yeah. hmm. uh I, it was big you know i didn't realize that it would expand the way mm -hmm. it did you know and i wasn't prepared for that mm -hmm. uh and i've got guys now that just beg me to start making them again yeah. but, you know it, it, those molds that i had you can't get them anymore that one you had a crawl that, that yes. was at a real wide but then the flapping of that and it was <clears throat> it was a big uh the body yeah, it was yes, big and it, round that it was, was a four a inch uh, it, yes uh I still have some. I, might be able to <laughs> I think I got some over here in these things, too. I'm going to pull them out a little later. But, but I, I had this guy. He he won uh, $100,000 on Smith Mountain Lake on that bait. No kidding. But he had me make it. It was a root beer color. You know how root yes. beer's got green in it. But he wanted just a little bit different color. And uh, so, yeah, he won a bass boat plus 50 grand. No kidding. Yeah. but And, and a lot of people, they won money uh off the baits and and uh they 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 were really good i used them all the time i want money on them, yeah you know? everybody would say what you use oh, just something I made up. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to give away your secrets that's right? right but yeah so you know i got out of the business uh do i regret somewhat yeah if if i had more help mm -hmm. i would have stayed with it you know but you know, I got to fish more. As I was gonna say, I cut into your fishing time. You mm -hmm. didn't get to fish as much. Yeah. So I imagine too, like listening to your analytical mind or just how you break things down, like um, plastics on the market now. Like what is, out of curiosity, like what is your favorite and why? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't, you know. Do you uh, have a particular brand or? No. No? It, this how I look at it. You know, when I, when I pick up a bait, and you watch me. If I go back here, pick a bait, the first thing I do is squeeze it. Mm. I'm checking the density, you know. Mm. I don't, uh, when, when I look at the bait, the first thing I look at, I look at color, you know, because mm. I have certain colors in my mind that I stick with. Uh, you know, does color really matter? I don't think it makes a lot of difference, but I think, you know, silhouette. Because mm -hmm. when a fish sees it, I mean, they say that they see some color. I don't know. You know, remember the red line, the red hooks and stuff mm -hmm. like that? You know, uh, supposed to represent like gill, mm -hmm. gill flash or something. Mm -hmm. uh, does it make a difference? Uh, I don't I don't think so. But I look at it as far as silhouette. You know, people, they always say that, that bass lures are better at catching people. Yeah, 100%. And, and, you know, it's top water. Mm-hmm. You know, people buy all these top water that's got all these colors. You know, when a bass looks up, they that's see right. the bottom. They don't. The so when I it. buy a lure, right. you know, for top water, I just look at the bottom. I don't look. I don't care about the top. So much truth to that. What yeah. are your three 
colors, just generic, yeah. like not not specifically to like a body of water that I know you've probably fished very well where there might be a little adjustments, but generically, if you were going to go, if I dumped you at any body of water, what are three colors that, that you would pick? Uh, well, obviously green pumpkin mm -hmm. is going to, it's going to go anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. But like, I'll tell you, a color that I use is called Bama bug, where you have your June bug over green pumpkin. That works in clear water, stain water. It it doesn't matter, you know. It mm. it it's just an all around color. So it would be Bama bug, uh, green pumpkin, and I may go to, uh, like a plum plum apple. Hmm. And and I'll tell you why. Uh, it seems as though the the uh, the plum apple works really really well in real clear water. Hmm. Uh, and uh, again, you know, when they talk about color, that they, they always say that the deeper the water, mm -hmm. there are certain colors that that don't show up mm -hmm. that aren't visible. And uh, obviously, when you get deeper deeper water you, you you know they talk about your blacks your blues and your mm -hmm. reds and stuff like that what's your what's your take on black because i know it's a weird like some people <clears throat> love it and some people think ah, eh, no it's not worth it uh black black is a good color you know i now if when you talk about like top water or or like muddy water black's really really good you know uh especially like top water on a cloudy day like today mm -hmm. i'd be throwing black uh this i i fish black like if the water's really stained but i like the neon black with the red flake it works really really well mm -hmm. uh do, do i think they see it no especially in muddy water they they don't they feel it mm -hmm. you know they don't they don't see it mm -hmm. it's profile i think too the big thing is, is yes. uh like you say uh, action like you say there's lateral lines and then profile is you know, probably Trump's the color. one thing I, I, I'll tell you this story. Uh, I, I always thought, you know, why in the heck do these fish eat worms? Mm -hmm. They don't see worms. But I, I was fishing muddy water one day and I caught this bass and that thing, his gills were full of worms. They were, hmm. they were actually leaking out the side. Is that what? Right? Yeah. And, and what I found was when you have heavy rain, the runoff oh, pushes yeah. worms in the river mm, okay in the creeks yeah, and stuff okay. and and he was just sitting there just huh yeah his gills they were actually running out of his gills wow that's the first time i ever seen it. and then i realized that you know actually they do eat yeah they see them huh especially in runoff right interesting that's crazy wow so what is something about like the river that you've seen has changed over the years? Cause I know we've been really big with like the Shelby, mm -hmm. uh, Shelby Odenkirk episode drop with the Jeff little one mm -hmm. talking about the rivers and stuff. Like from your experience, what have you seen? The biggest thing, you know, I seen, well, of course, you know, obviously I've been fishing since I was five and I, I remember my mother get a zip code and a, and a little mm -hmm. like fiberglass. It might've been a metal rod. I'm old as hell, but anyhow, <laughs> uh, the river was really, really, it was deeper. Yeah. It was a lot deeper. I remember my grandparents sitting on the bank and they had the old cane poles, you mm. know, and of course that black, old, remember the old black braid line, mm. nylon line? And they were catching perch, but it was deep. Now that same place is level. You can walk across it and mm -hmm. not get your knees mm -hmm. wet. Wow. So, you know, the river dropping is, is what I've noticed the most and, and, the grass, I remember a time when the grass was just so thick you couldn't hardly walk. Mm -hmm. It's not like that anymore. But I have been noticing that the grass is starting to come back. Mm -hmm. And that average depth, I think, you know, to your point, and you're talking average because obviously we get a lot of rain, it'll come up. Um, but we were saying too, though, it takes no time at all for that water to get back low again. And it's really low right now. And we actually had a pretty wet uh yes. summer spring and summer um now i think and i and i think about this all the time too I, I'm, I'm guessing we're taking out so much water for these cities as as people move i, th I think and this is a personal opinion as i'm thinking about it is you know when you live in the country you're on well you had a well which is still you know but that's underground water seeping in or right. whatever but as we consolidate the cities and towns and those water towers if we're pulling water out of the, the river and we're having to serve 
more people, more showers, more toilets, more everything, businesses, all these things. Um, it it is for to your point for it to be yeah. deeper and now just you shallow. Know, I think we've kind of contributed to that. You, don't you, you think? think about it. Even thirty years ago, the population mm-hmm. that was in in Chandler County mm-hmm. or even Frederick County mm-hmm. is is not is. I mean, it's exploded. Yes. Mm-hmm. People moving from Northern Virginia mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. you know, other states. Well, towns, each town mm-hmm. pumps water mm-hmm. and they pump it through, they, of course, they filtration system and all that. They're pumping that. Plus, what they, them water tires is what they store. They just mm-hmm. store that. Gotcha. Water. Mm-hmm. So you, you look, you got uh, New Market, Mount Jackson, Edinburgh, uh, Brooks, Woodstock, Tom Brook. You know, Strasburg mm-hmm. and, and on. Mm-hmm. You know, they're pulling water. They mm-hmm. have to. They mm-hmm. have to get it somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, again, even though we may get the same amount of rainfall, right? You're still taking that Out water more than so. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's not gonna. It's not gonna be like it's gonna raise and stay. It's because it, mm-hmm. they're still gonna take water. Mm-hmm. What is the primary like? Now that we're into this this fall and and or sorry, the summer to fall transition. When this episode drops, it'll it'll be mid mid September. What are the smallmouth keying in on on the river right now? Is it the mad tom? Is it the crayfish? Is there something else that we're not thinking about? And, and- uh, from from what I see, you know, most of the the smallmouth right now, you know, they have their moments when it gets really really hot. You know, they they suspend a lot. You know, uh, I think more than likely, my guess is they're feeding on crayfish. That's that's their main food. That's that's their go to. You know, if they get to uh, well. They're opportunistic feeders. Right. Mm-hmm. They get they get an opportunity they're going to take a shot at, you know. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, uh, the crayfish, uh, and of course your mad toms to pluck at when they see them. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I you know, and, and it's funny, but most of I don't catch a lot of smallmouth on worms. I mean, I can, I, I use them, you know, but it's just it for me. Uh, I, I stick more to like tubes mm-hmm. and, uh, like jigs mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, there's certain baits that I'll use that I know mm-hmm. that'll work. But for me, when I get on the water, the first thing I do is let them tell me what they want, mm-hmm. you know, cause you, there, there's three basic water columns. You got your top, your middle and your bottom. Mm-hmm. They're going to be feeding off of one. Mm-hmm. So I let them dictate what they want. And then mm-hmm. I go from there mm-hmm. and then I'll figure out a pattern and mm-hmm. then I'll just work it. You mm-hmm. say worms, but do you also mean like the Ned rig? Do you counter that in uh, there? Or is that a separate thing from a worm? That's separate for me. Now, okay. uh, when I say worms, you know, I like a Cinco, you know, like mm-hmm. a wacky rig, they'll, they'll eat it, you know. Mm-hmm. Especially if they're in that middle water column, mm-hmm. you want something that that's slow, mm-hmm. get some time to you know mm-hmm. check it out. But if they're on the bottom, you know you want something fast to the bottom. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, a Ned rig, I'm fishing uh, like the small, I guess TRD stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess that's considered a worm. Now, did you fish those back in the day, the TRD or the the Ned rig, the Ned? <clears throat> no. Uh, I remember when the Ned rig came out, mm-hmm. you know, back in the day, they were called stand-up jigs. Mm. And uh, I can't even think of the company that, that brought them out. But they had they were real fine mm-hmm. wire hooks, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that, now they call them Ned rigs. Mm-hmm. But they, they're not much different. They're just smaller heads, you know. Yeah. Well, what do you compare and contrast the difference on the, on the Ned rig versus the tube? Because I know that there's a lot of people that will only fish the tube. Uh, that is a cult following still, especially mm-hmm. among river rats. But the tube has slowly become like a go-to for smallmouth anglers, you know, from here all the way up to like Lake Erie. Like, do, right. are they the same thing or do they have n- niches that they, they do fit nicely in? Uh, I think your your tube, you know, it, it, it can imitate a lot of baits, you know. It, it can imitate a goby. It can imitate a mad tom. It can imitate a crawfish. Uh, and, and I just think that the action of a tube depending on how you rig it, you know, it, it gets that erratic action, you know, where, you know, like a dead rig, if you, you take a dead rig and, you know, of course there's several different ways to fish it. You could stroke it, drag it. Uh, but 
it, you know, it's just a smaller profile. And, and a tube, it's a little thicker, you know. It's got that profile and it's got the tentacles on the end. So, you know, it just gives that illusion that of a crayfish mm -hmm. for the most part, which mm -hmm. is a smallmouth's main forage. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why they key in on that like they do. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff Little just, he dropped, uh, he was telling us when we talked to him about yeah. going to the Susquehanna and doing a, oh my God, he yeah. put the, um, tell him about the, um, the circle, sorry to cut you yeah, off, about no, that circle. No, so see, he talked, and, and you were talking about this earlier too, off camera about just watching people catch fish. And one thing that he did the same thing you're doing now, as far as taking people fishing. And so when you're, when you're watching somebody fish, you're also watching fish. You're not fishing. Sometimes we're fishing, we're focused on casting and fishing and we're not really paying attention to the the fish if we can see right. and a lot of times in the rivers we can see, you can see down into that yes you can watch them and one thing he said he he observed these fish up on the susquehanna he said they'll literally run laps i mean they'll they'll come around they're swimming and that's the thing too we take for granted they're swimmers they're going to swim mm -hmm. around and he said that you can literally that that fish same fish will come back around as it's you know yeah. searching for food uh but what he also did he put the uh goggles on snorkel he's got a real short you know, less than two minute clip, uh, turned over rocks on the Susquehanna. And what I think is cool too, is why to your point on that, watching the natural forage, you know, these crayfish and how they respond and react. Um, so to your point, if you're letting that tube sit on the bottom and it's sitting there, just like a crayfish will do, they'll get up in that defensive system Exactly. and those things. And they've got those long, he talked about it too. He talked about, you know, their long little antennas or whatever you want right. to call them. They're coming Feelers. out feelers and they've got you know all this stuff so that's it's mimicking that now when you pop it or drag it if you ever watch these crayfish swim i mean they're gonna they're gonna go from you know like this to they're gonna come in tight yes. and they're gonna swim backwards mm -hmm. yeah. so that popping action or dragging action to your point is i mean that's well, yeah, that's it, what they're it, seeing it every day like and that's what they're keying into get away. Yes. yeah absolutely yeah so um i just think that's you know fascinating too because sometimes we don't spend enough time and it's what you talked about before, and, and Jeff does the same thing, talking about the forage, their environment under that water, and how their behavior is, um, and what they're eating. And, and, you know, and it's like, you know, if I fish, like, the North and South Fork, I tend, you know, I look for colors. Like, if I'm fishing a bait fish mm -hmm. color, any bait fish color is going to be a bluegill, mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, like, a it's always going to have a dark back mm -hmm. and a light bottom. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't vary from that. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of guys use white, all white. Mm -hmm. it, it'll work. Mm -hmm. Small mouth, light, freaky colors mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if you get a place that's pressured, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you may catch one in here or there, mm -hmm. but I'm after catching all I can. Right. So I'm going to pick a bait that I know looks as much like what they're mm -hmm. as possible. Matching the hatch. Yep. You know, natural. Uh, I, I you know, this new forward facing sonar mm -hmm. live imaging and mm -hmm. all that uh I, my boat i just got a new boat and uh i got it set up with 360 and all that i don't have the mega live but you know uh, again with that sonar if you if you are any good at angling mm -hmm. this this is like i mean you, you look at guys like jacob willer mm -hmm. connell neil video games Mm -hmm. You know, back when, uh, years and years ago, you would get on a crappy file and you, your 2D sonar, you could jig it mm -hmm. and you could watch them come up to it mm -hmm. on, on 2D, mm -hmm. which that's how it started. Mm -hmm. Well, now this Mega Live, you know, it's even better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're any good of an angler like me, I, I, if I see a fish, I can tell you real mm -hmm. quick, like two, two minutes, whether I can catch mm -hmm. it or not, mm -hmm. because it's all about watching their reaction. Mm -hmm. And that's what this new, mm -hmm. you know, Mega Live and Live Scope, mm -hmm. all that does for you. And you got experience with that. That Your last big one yeah, came so, on. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So if you guys want to see it on the channel, it dropped. I actually went down to Shane Flynn Outdoors. He runs a tackle shop down there. And he had me out on the boat on Lake Mooney in Frederick. Mm -hmm. And so, which was really cool. He has a $30,000 pimped out John boat with a torpedo, all this other stuff. And he has Live Scope. Um, I had live scope on my boat, but I had to, I had to sell it for college. But when we were there, we were following bait schools and then yeah. I was, um, and the video will drop eventually, but I was fishing a spy bait through the school of shad. And all of a sudden this blob just shoots straight up and noses it. And then he starts to leave. And as soon as he leaves, I pop the bail. So the spy bait just flutters. 
And he tracked it all the way down to the bottom and then one pop, boom, got it. Yeah, incredible. And, and that's something where, and this is what's so fun about this, especially in the comment section. I, I love all you people that have such fantastic things to say um, about like, well, is it's like the flathead. I mean, I, goodness. Is it should be should a uh, mm -hmm. live scope be legal? Is it not? Does mm -hmm. it make you a fisherman? Is it just mm -hmm. the live scope? Mm -hmm. This is the way I look at it. I was in youth sports for about 15 years as a coach mm -hmm. when the when they had no rule regulations on double wall bats for kids. Right, right. The idea was you could go get your kid a five hundred to six hundred dollar Easton mm -hmm. and you could have a 10 year old that has never hit a home run before knock one three hundred feet. Mm -hmm. And you can come and I, this is where I'm going to go with this. You can complain about it. But if it is legal. You can die on your morals and your kid doesn't get to make all stars or you can buy the bat. Mm -hmm. Regardless, as long as it's legal, it's here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think those are two separate conversations to mm -hmm. have there. Like, should the pros have it? I don't know. That's one conversation. Is mm -hmm. it fun as hell to go out with? Absolutely. It's well, a lot of fun. I think it's still a tool because <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you didn't have that in that example, you would have kept yep. going at the same retrieval. Yep. That fish turned and went away. You would have kept coming mm -hmm. back. There was no fish there. You cast again. Yeah. And but because so it changes, it does two things. It changes our behavior, but but we change our behavior based on what how we're seeing the fish respond. Mm -hmm. And no other technology except for hook and look when they went down with cameras right. and stuff, do we or the GoPro, yep. Yep, you yep, know, yep, yep. have we been able to uh actively watch real time their response to what we're throwing. Right. And and, and suspended. To your point too, suspended, the hardest fish to catch. Exactly. We, we couldn't catch none is that suspended. You couldn't catch them before because you know, well, and, and it's just cha it's changing. I think we're going to be so much more knowledgeable. And and, about it. and these the professionals, they're they're finding fish where they normally yes, would. You know, right. when when I uh, a wise old man told me, ninety percent of the fish live in ten percent of the water, which yeah. is absolutely gospel to me. Mm -hmm. And another thing that's absolutely gospel to me is ten percent of the fish or ten percent of the fishermen catch ninety percent of the fish. Hmm. I agree with that. I, mean, I think there, I think the biggest thing mm -hmm. was. I think with what pan optics and live forward facing sonar has shown us is how many big fish, how much of the population does not live in three feet of water, mm -hmm. which is insane. Correct. Right? And the other thing is like how many times we fished a bank as a kid. And I remember when I did the Marshall junior bass and you fish a cover, like there's nothing here. Mm -hmm. Bullshit. Right. You take pan optics and you look at it. It's like, no, you just suck that day or something That's right. because yeah. you can just fan that thing through there. And Correct. you're insane about the life in these lakes. Mm -hmm. It's, it's crazy. Well, yeah. and the amount of pressure. Yeah. Pushes these fish mm -hmm. away from that. Mm -hmm. So they see this like, like mm -hmm. pressure. Then fish, how many lures oh my and God. you know that would be like me taking somebody and every day at the same time mm -hmm. same place and slapping them how long do you think they're going to take that before they say you know what i gotta make a change that's right i'm gonna come at a Here different he comes. time i'm leaving you know I'm going and that's it there. these fish see those baits how many times have we cast and there was actually a eight pounder and never even looked at just yeah. sat there and right watched, you know that's right and and with this new new system the mega live and live scope and stuff you can look at their reaction and like i said i can look at a fish i can tell you if i can see that fish i can tell you whether i can yeah. get you or not yeah mm -hmm. i mean and one more thing because this was not supposed to become the forward facing sonar show but um so we were out with them and he was telling me about all the bait that they had there and what we were seeing on the screen in these small balls just that were not near any bait and he's like well that's bluegill or crappie or stuff like that and to me it's like my brain went off when I had panoptics in my boat. It's like the only way you're gonna know if you catch it. And right. They weren't biting anything, so it's like you know what, screw it. So I went down in my in my bag I brought, and I did bring some Berkeley Gulp crappie jigs, mm -hmm. and so I tied that up and I put it out there, let it drop down, thunk, fourteen inch bass, yeah, thunk, what? fourteen inch bass. They were keying in on little those mm -hmm. bait balls, even though it's blurry. And this is the one thing that mm -hmm. I don't have the eye for yet. They weren't big. Mm. Those were very small clusters of minnows or forge, whatever it was mm. there. And those fish were keying in on those super small things and were going in there and they were just sucking in a thousand yep, at a exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And that's the one thing that's like right. without forward facing sonar, you wouldn't pick up on any of that stuff. That's at right. All. So it is a really cool yeah, learning tool. It's, mm. it's a it and there's more innovations coming, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you just uh you either get with the program or mm -hmm. you know, if you want to be yeah. competitive you, you you have to you mm -hmm. know but you know again can you fish without it absolutely oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah like jeff luger or, or jeff yeah jeff, jeff luger mm -hmm. and travis yeah. like uh, travis specifically man he says like he doesn't want to have it on his boat mm -hmm. and what he sees which i think is interesting from the counter argument more people are leaving the bank alone now yeah so he talks Correct. about lake anna where you know a couple of years ago all the docks were getting pounded mm -hmm. and he says now like at a certain time of year 
it's almost like he gets mm-hmm. it all to himself. Mm-hmm. And so it's very interesting that you see this. A John Cox is another great example mm-hmm. of that where yes. you can't, it's very hard, mm-hmm. but you still have the ability to make a living up shallow. Mm-hmm. It's hard, but it's still doable. Mm-hmm. So uh, locals that, you know, with your experience on the Shenandoah River all up and down the valley, um, and for those who don't know, North Fork, South Fork, coming together, Front Royal, Main Stem, right. um, what are some different sections that uh, if you had an option or choice, to go out and fish, what what are a couple different ones you would you would either target or and there's some common ones like Riverton. Everybody knows about Riverton, but maybe also what are some less common ones that you would well recommend people go out as far as like if if you're floating, you know the river, uh, it there's it, it's so shallow, mm-hmm. you know unless you're in a kayak. If mm-hmm. you're in a john boat, it'd be kind of rough. But mm-hmm. As far as putting a regular boat in, you have basically three options you have shenandoah riverton and each of ben mm-hmm. you know now riverton and, and this time of year i fish mm-hmm. but i don't put a lot of you know emphasis on whether i catch a lot or not mm-hmm. you know but each of ben right now is fishing really really well so now, talk I about each of ben a little bit because yeah. you've got some experience on that again I, a lot of people I've don't seen know a, about it. a lot uh two to four year old fish mm. so uh apparently there was a good spawn uh between two to four years ago and i'm seeing a lot of that every now and then you you'll see a two pounder you know uh there's some threes some heavy threes and and a few fives mm-hmm. in each event uh each event is, is grass is up it's fishing really good uh I like uh, each band through the week, but it still it doesn't get the pressure. Riverton gets a mm, lot, a lot of, pressure of pressure from mm-hmm. pleasure boaters, you know, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I usually tend to stick to Riverton like February, mm-hmm. you know, March and April. Mm-hmm. Each band, I, I I'll fish that you know pretty much year round. Mm-hmm. Uh, on a weekend, there's usually more boats there than through the week, obviously, but you, they're still mm. it's still fishable shenandoah is really good it doesn't get the pressure that the other two gets mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. riverton gets the most pressure uh there's still some decent smallmouth of good ones i mm-hmm. caught one there in march of four and a quarter uh but it, it's it's it, like i said you know I, I went yesterday i think we caught like seven or eight smallmouth mm-hmm. But the one thing I've noticed is the perch are coming back. That the, the sun, uh, the yellow perch or the uh, or the bluegill and the pumpkin seed, pumpkin seed mm-hmm. uh, at I, Riverton, all over, all over. Okay, Egypt, Ben, hmm. Riverton. I mean, I have not seen this many in quite a few years. Hmm. And this year I've seen and some good sized ones actually. I was teaching a guy to fly fish over uh, Egypt, Ben. who probably been about two months ago and uh he 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 hooked uh he brought a perch in that was a bluegill and that thing was bigger than my hand wow. i had not seen them like that in years that's good too that, that's yeah, another forage sign. source mm-hmm. for to the bass you know i can tell you too you know uh slacker water on egypt bend but you know you put your big motor on uh prop motors uh you old snappy uh shando valley Last year, not this year, but last year, caught an eight pounder yeah, in the there. first near you know, largemouth, more largemouth down there too. It was eight fourteen, on, right? It was eight fourteen, and that, and it was within the first ten to fifteen minutes of the tournament, yeah. first term of the year, and that stood as the big fish for the whole year, including lakes like Smith Mountain Lake, Lake Anna you know, some of your bigger lakes, um, Potomac River, right. like you know, that's. Well, you know, what's that tell you? That's impressive. Now, do you think um, the state put a, a odd slot limit on that body of water, that section there a while back? Did you, do you, did that have anything? Of course, I don't think people really are remember keeping the bass. Um, it was an odd slot limit. Like you, it, it was uh, four. It was uh, fourteen to twenty. And you could keep one over twenty. Yeah, and they were holding tournaments there, and that was the big thing about yeah. saying, okay, you can you're going to catch. You know, guys are it catching had to be over seventeen for you to bring or, yeah, eighteen in. or nineteen inches, yeah. and you could only have one. You might catch three of those, and you got to throw two back, and like it just didn't bode well for tournaments. No. But uh, I don't know if that had anything to do. I with think a you know. I think it really. 
it, it helped, mm-hmm. you know, because the, number one, and we know this, you, you, you carry a fish in your live well, it stresses mm-hmm. it, right. you know, and, and when that fish is mm-hmm. 20, 20 inches, four or five pounds, that mm-hmm. fish is up there in years, mm-hmm. you know. Hmm. So it, it doesn't, so now you got fish that you're not putting in the live well, you're putting them right by. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't stress them as mm-hmm. much. I think it, it made a big difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, again, I don't see, uh, the, I caught one at Egypt Bend about a month ago that was three, 315. But that fish was only in a foot of water, you know. And it, hmm. you know, surprisingly, up on the other end of Egypt Bend where the, it's really fast water, there's hmm. large, there's big largemouth up there that hmm. people don't even realize. No largemouth or smallmouth bass, 11 to 14 inches. Yeah, they changed it. North, south, and yeah, mainstream. Yeah, they changed it, what, last year year before, so they've opened <clears throat> it back up. But okay. yeah. I think it made, it made a difference, you know. And I have, I've seen some big, Jeremy, he's caught some big down near the dam, caught some big. Yeah, yes. Big I know a guy big. took an eight pounder out of there. Yeah. It's kind of depressing, but it is what uh, it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, the biggest one I caught at each bend was seven and a half. I caught one at Anna this year that was uh, right at eight pounds. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, like you could go over to Egypt Bend, you know, and throw a jackhammer. Believe it or not, I've I've been over there. Now I won't throw lures like that when it's clear, mm. but when that water gets stained or something like that, you know, little stain, I mean, I've caught some good ones on mm-hmm. jackham. Just and, and you know, a lot of people will cast them wine. I drag it, just absolutely drag it. I know another guy that fishes it like a jig, and yep. that's that's a uh, and that's what I was telling somebody the other day. The jackhammer, in my opinion, changed fishing too, as far as lures. Uh, kind of replace the spinner bait. I mean, there's each to their own. Again, there's there's time and place for different things. Yeah. But the versatility of the jackhammer, mm-hmm. uh, fishing all levels of water column to your point, including the bottom, which a lot of people don't do. You know, slow rolling or dragging it like a jig. Uh, that vibration and match with the profile yeah. of the skirt, like in the versatility. I mean, it is. It's it's a great lure. Well, I mean, dragging it on the bottom. It you know, depending on what color. I mean. When I fish a jackhammer on the river, I'm using green pumpkin red. Mm. Uh, I won't use any other color. Mm-hmm. And dragging that on the bottom, I mean, it, it looks like a crawfish just yes. strong. On yeah, the bottom, same thing. Know? That. Yeah. And let me say too, again, I talked to a customer yesterday about this. Doc Hethco turned me on up at Susquehanna. How powerful, how strong that jackhammer is. Like, I mean, mm. uh, so river, river, ponds, lakes, does not matter. It works everywhere. You know, there are certain baits that can work across all bodies of water and that is that is one of them well that's what i caught my personal best on at anna this year mm. was a jackhammer dragging it on the bottom wow yeah that thing hit i thought i had a log <laughs> it was amazing I, and you I, still probably get you get the same excitement oh yeah as if you, you were back to five I years could show old you the video, but uh there's some profanity <laughs> on it <laughs> so when do you like to throw a jackhammer versus a crankbait versus uh, others for well off? you know again the one thing, like like especially fishing the river, you know these these fish they're pressured. It's, if you can get a big boat in, it's getting the pressure. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. you don't have as much pressure where they float, but it still gets some. Mm-hmm. Uh, like to me, if I throw a jackhammer, like say I'm fishing Egypt Bend or or Riverton or whatever, and I throw a jackhammer, and you know, I don't get bit. Then I'll downsize. That's where I'll go to a crankbait, mm. you know, uh, depending on the water clarity and the temperature of the water. Uh, I like to throw a jackhammer when I got a lot of current, you know. Mm. It, 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 you know, they don't have a lot of time to look at it, but mm. they they can see it. They can feel it, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, I prefer to throw smaller crankbaits, you know, than, than a jackhammer. Now, if I'm fishing a Potomac, you're going to throw a jackhammer. Mm-hmm. And then the baby minus and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, uh, crankbaits, I, I throw them a lot, especially in shallow water. Uh, the jackhammer usually comes out if I think, you know, I'm, I'm targeting like bigger fish because mm-hmm. normally with the jackhammer, pretty good size. Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. You're catching bigger ones. And I think you said earlier too, the jig. 
I mean, even that, the Jaguars, and, 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 they're, and they're opportunistic because I've always felt too. Yeah, you could be throwing, you could have thrown maybe the jig in the same thing, and it may or may not have. Like I'm not saying it's always holds true, but because they're opportunistic, and if you're staying on that bottom, that I think a lot of times the bigger bass, you know, they're going to pretty much stay the bottom. They'll suspend too, depends. But, right. But you you have a better opportunity, I think, to catch bigger bass mm-hmm. on the bottom when you're dragging stuff. To your point. Well, they don't want to spend a lot of energy. Right. You know, uh, big bass, they, they just don't, you know, mm. th- their their goal is to mm. live and, mm. and uh, you know, not expend as much energy. Mm. So when a certain thing comes by, I've seen them eat baby ducks yeah. right off the water. Right. Really? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Saw that. Where? Couldn't when? It. Like, I need I need more intel on this. <laughs> uh, actually, it was. Like, you uh, see these damn baits. Like, I went yeah. to ICAST. And it's like this is a savage. Like, I don't know, gosling, and it's yeah. like maybe for a hunter that needs to put out some decoys. <laughs> but how many smallmouth are going to smoke one of those things? Or I them? actually, it happened on uh, Egypt Bend. Uh, they were they were wood ducks and had huh. little ones, and they were going across the river, and I mean, absolutely exploded on it. And there was five, then there was four. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, gone. And I believe it. Like, I uh, was mowing at the river a lot yesterday, and, and almost a big old frog. I mean, big old frog. Oh, yeah. And um, I took it down by the river and sat it down. I went back about 20 minutes later, still sitting there. And I thought, you know, and I, I dropped in the river, and that thing started swimming. I, I was just waiting for a big old bass to come up there. But, you know, mice, you know, same yeah, thing. I mean, yeah, they they're, again, mice. they're opportunistic. They're yeah. Kinda, I mean, they got to live, you know. Yeah. Uh, snakes yep, mice yep. ducks right. Spiders, anything they I can mean, get yeah yep. i mean and flies many you know fly you talking about fly fishermen and i'm always intrigued by guys that do there's certain guys in this in fishing that are are exclusive fly fishing only that's mm-hmm. all they do they won't pick up a bait cast or a spinning rod nothing wrong with things <laughs> i'm about to say it's just that everybody there's a lot of different areas some guys are cat fishermen uh, you talk the fairy wand, you know, yeah. some guys are only power fishing. They won't pick up the, the fairy wand. They won't. But think about guys that are, and I'm kind of like this too, that, uh, can dabble with the fly fishing, the fly tying, the, the hair, uh, you, yep. you were talking earlier about small profile and how they'll gulp all that up. Mm-hmm. Well, you, if you cut them open, you're going to see too, a ton of flies yeah. or like yeah. larva that or flies that are the, the helger mite is, is, you know, what yeah, stone it's fly, a Dobson right? fly. Dobson flies. So, from the time it comes out under that merges under that rock and goes to the surface and gets wings, they're eating as many of yeah. those things too. You know, and so when I'm uh, did fly fishing, I I I really studied entomology. Yep, there you, you know? go. So I wanted to learn about that. Mm-hmm. So when I would go fly fishing, you pick a rock up and look at the mer- you know all the little mm-hmm. caddises and yep, stuff, yep. and you know you, you knew. Mm-hmm. So when I go fishing. The first thing I do when I get on the river is I look for fly hatches. Mm-hmm. So if I see them mm. coming off, you know, around here we have trico, sulfurs, and stuff like that, you know. If I see a hatch coming off, the first thing that happens is you got your bait fish, your small fish eating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, something's going to eat them. Yeah. So that's what triggers it. Mm. So when I see a hatch coming off, I know mm-hmm. that I can fish top water. Gotcha. It's coming. Gotcha. That makes sense. When in that circumstance do you see that smallmouth are going to change to floating uh, aquatic insects? Because, again, this is tying back into, you know, by the time this airs, like I actually interviewed uh, Nolan Miner's brother who actually finished second in the Susquehanna uh, Hobie tournament, and they're throwing. It's probably here somewhere. If not, we'll, we'll get I've one to show it to the it, camera. Yeah. Uh, but it's like At a top moment, water. It, Gizmo. Gizmo. gizmo yeah the gizmo i've seen it and it was the fact that i'm trying to get this guy on that he talked to a new river guide and he said fly fishermen always outproduce regular mm. anglers in the summertime it's because they're throwing bugs yeah and that got nolan from a to b to be like well this is what mm. we got to do when does that happen when does that transition happen if that is credible information of course that bigger smallmouth start keying in on insects i think uh when you know especially like we talked about them being opportunities feeders, you know, when, mm. when we had the locusts, mm-hmm. you know, they, the, obviously they want more bang for their buck, mm-hmm. but you know, if, if there's a hatch coming off and they're pretty good sized mayflies, you'll see them start sipping and, and, and eating, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it, I think all that does is just keep them 
going from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. You know, to, they they get more bang for the buck for like crayfish and stuff. But any any time something like that comes along, you know, they're going to key in on it. But they're going to key in more on that minnow or that perch that's eating them mm -hmm. because it's a bigger meal. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Uh, your hatches usually start coming off around March and then they just consistently, you mm -hmm. know, depend. and most of your hatches happen around fast water mm -hmm. close. So that's where it starts. And then of course you got your, they emerge and then they, they, they do their thing and then they, they're spent, you know, they're spinners. Mm -hmm. So the spinners, if you see a lot of activity more than likely it's spinners, they're just mm -hmm. sipping them, you mm -hmm. know, but when they come out of the water, they're more they're 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 more on like the uh, dragonfly and right. stuff like that. You know? right? That's interesting, That's and really you'll cool. know too. Like as a fly fisherman, what's interesting it made me think. You're exactly right. Fly fisherman is your false casting too. You got to think too as a fish. Like, and this is this is so interesting to me because you go back to the crayfish. We're talking about dragon crayfish are predominantly going to live on the bottom. That's yeah. where right. they live. So. So fish, they know that. So their their noses are going to be down right. like that. Now, when they go in, maybe when they move up shallow, um, the problem right now is the water temperature is so stinking hot right now. So it's going to yes. be even hotter up shallow, so it'll be deeper. But as you get into the fall is a good time, too, because the water cools. Right. Um, but as those fish are, are feeding up, too, like you were saying earlier, they're looking up. But a fly fisherman, when you false cast, and it's almost like they see it, and... You've had times where, or we've all had this too, even a spinning rod, when that, as soon as that thing hits the water, it's bam. Like yeah, they're, they're on, on it. it. Like yep. Sometimes you're walk, 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 or whatever, and then it takes it. They're but feeding how up. How many times? Because they're feeding up. They're already yeah. looking. As soon as they see it, they're going now. Why? Because like if that dragonfly yeah. was to land and take off, yeah. they miss they, it. They, they, so they see better yes. what, what you think they do. Yeah, that's right. You know, yep. it, it's all about silhouette. Yep, yep, you know? yep. And, and uh, again, we do like when I go, I, I'm I'm looking at either they're on top, they're mm -hmm. on the middle, right. they're on the bottom. Right. So I base what I'm going to use by how they show me what they want. Yeah, and what's so fascinating? You were talking about Potomac earlier. Like I was amazed how the flopper. It sometimes things will fish all day, mm -hmm. and it's not just it's overcast. I mean, it was blowing my mind before. Like we were getting a plopper bite, and I'm like, and, and there's not a cloud in the sky, and the sun's out, and it's noon. I'm like, what yeah. is going on? This goes against all. But when you think too, but go back to that too. If the grass is up, if they're depending on where they're at, like to your point, right, in the column. Now, yeah, they don't like it. They prefer it if it's going to be cloudy. That's probably not a preferred thing. But it doesn't mean, especially in shallow water. What I got to thinking too, you have those three, but it doesn't mean that something you're bringing in a mid mid level water column that doesn't bring that fish up. That's somebody else has told me talking about yep. this live scope stuff. He was amazed how far fish would go because he he's over here. And he'll see these fish come like a long distance to take that lure yes. when they're feeding. I mean, when they're hungry. Yeah. If they're not, they're not like you say. They're well, not going to expend the energy. Yeah. Right. They're just going. You better. You got to put and drop in front of the nose. But I mean, there's just so many variables to it. Yeah. You know, I always said it's almost like a science. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's it's I, I've watched fish. You know, all thirty seven years I've, I've watched, and and yeah. they've done some crazy things you mm -hmm. know and I, it just it amazes me every day i go out it's like totally different, different. just restarting mm -hmm. interesting and that also makes you think like how long should you truly stick with something because mm -hmm. i think that's one thing with live scope so i also i blew i blew shane's mind down there where i actually i brought my swim bait box that's what i do and so i i brought out this it was like a 300 hundred dollar glide bait i had but it was a deep sinker and i chucked this thing out there and we washed it on a live scope and the amount of dots that zoomed in and yes. followed it. Yes. You never would have saw that, but the amount of followers. Correct. And then I remember back to like the Marshall Club where I have a guy that sticks with one bait all day. And it kind of makes you click like, are we sticking with the bait too long? Because if, if just doing this, all these fish are following it that I don't see before live scope, how many times was I fishing over fish that truly weren't interested, but I, I forced something too Correct. long. Correct. And then it makes people like Aaron Martin, these other people that would like take time out of their day and just redo all their tackle because mm -hmm. they'd be like, it's not working. We got to mm -hmm. adjust. Because I think I think we give that too much credit where we shouldn't force a bait. We we, we get this weird thing that you have to force something. Yeah, you have three you baits. Have, lock you in have your hand. to know either it's going to work or not. Like yeah. those the glide baits, mm -hmm. I've got them. The, they're great. And if I'm fishing big fish water, you know I'll throw them. But 
to I'd watch fish and I'm telling you when they're tracking that thing mm -hmm. if it's just doing the mm -hmm. same thing more than likely they're going to be like okay I'm done yeah you exactly. know so get even like baits that I use I put a little scent on them I've watched the mm -hmm. difference between adding scent and not adding scent mm -hmm. I've seen them track it and you put scent on they track it and you know now they say they can they can smell I don't know but it made a difference mm -hmm. you know but just like these glide baits and you can't really and, and we we probably all done this where you see a a, a fish coming to your bait and and then it stops and mm. you you know you do mm. a little extra and mm. you know it, it hammers it you can't really do that with a glide bait mm. more or less you just like keep whining or just a little twitch and, and yeah and stop it yeah i think the reason i brought the glide bait try to articulate my point a little bit better is that a glide bait really pulls fish mm -hmm. yeah when you when you combine that with live scope you realize how many fish actually see your bait I was guilty of this mm -hmm. where I throw a chatterbait too long, mm -hmm. where I think like, okay, I'm going to fish like, you know, four coves of the chatterbait without thinking like, there's probably about a thousand fish that saw that bait and chose not to eat it. Correct. And I should have been better. And this is something Ricky talked to us about mm -hmm. where he would fish one cove once and then yep. he'd adjust bait and go yep. back through the same cove yeah. because True. he knew like there's fish there. There's if they fish. didn't want it, yes. it's because the bait was wrong, not that there weren't fish there. That is so true. And that's where I think live scope has blown my mind. It's like, yeah, that's right. I, I, I stick with baits too long where it's like clearly enough fish saw the chatterbait or the spinnerbait today. I could probably keep throwing it and find maybe one in the lake that, that wants eat to eat it. it. Yeah. And then I'm like, ah, this is perfect. This is the deal where it's, it's those great anglers. They'd know, nope, got to make a switch. They're here. I fished around them. But they just didn't want it. And the challenge to your point is not over because some of us too, we go so fast. Yes. Like we don't stick with it long enough. It's that window of how long, and that, how, you bring yeah. that up a lot. It's how so long hard. do you stick with it versus not? And mm -hmm. But it goes back to what you said. Again, the good ones are paying attention to what the fish yes. are telling you mm -hmm. based on, and it could be once you've changed your rate of retrieval to or worked all levels of column. But again, I like that recycling back through and trying yep. something yeah, different. Absolutely. You know, yeah. like e Egypt Bend or even Riverton, you know, I fish one end different than I do the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because number one, mm -hmm. you get down and, and I got that 360, which is amazing, by the way. It shows you everything. Which is interesting too. I mean, I thought about that question. Is there you how uh much is that used on the river? And to your point uh, it is. I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you you'd be surprised mm -hmm. at at what's actually gotcha. that you don't you know, like for what instance on Riverton. You know, what I thought in my mind mm was not actually what it was because right. when you get down close to the dam it kind of makes a, a cut you know towards the dam well in my mind this is going to be muddy because of the way the current flows mm. well on my 360 told me there was ledges that i didn't even know was there and they wasn't far off the bank and so i sat there and started catching smallmouth and there is a great example of a man that grew up fishing the river same river. Yep, thirty-seven and years and dragging stuff up. and doing stuff, and then and the river. When we talk about river too, for those who don't know, it's not a very it's not wide, no, by any means. And no. so you've grown up your whole life fishing this body of water, and then now again with this tool with this technology, and I heard that about the lenders when they back even five ten years ago, yeah. their bodies of water, their home waters that they knew. It was more that they found new fish. They found new fish in new places that right. old fish, and that's that's so fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, there's. I and found you're talking, places you're that, talking three to four days a week that you fish. It's not yes. like just uh, once a weekend, once a month. You were on no. the water, knew the water, and what you thought is wasn't. That's that's fascinating. I'm got, actually fishing places that I had never fished on on these bodies of water because I thought yes. that the bottom composition mm -hmm. was actually different than what it was. Which I want to say real quick too goes back to this that idea of pressure. Like you're saying, yes, there is pressure in certain areas but if you get off that bank and find area those right. those fish you're talking about now aren't pressured no. because people don't know that that ledge is there yeah no. and for the people at home that don't understand so what 360 is um it's like side scan sonar and so if i'm going to use this it's almost like radar where the head rotates in front of the trolling motor like this and it refreshes completely around your boat 360 if that's what you want to do the bottom contour so it, it lays that side scan format around completely so you can see what the bottom looks like completely around you um and it really does complement with people that fish forward facing sonar so especially like crappie fishermen swear by having both because one will, will tell you exactly where the brush pile is and then you can look to see where or what's actually in said brush pile 
I have the old version on my boat right now. I want to get the newer version because that one is literally what won me all that money back in I think it was 2008 when I won 10 grand. Because you could one thing is you can line up your casts so much better. You know that 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 grass clump is 90 feet out. Boom, right there, and you can hit it almost every time. And that's that's the one thing I absolutely love it's about it. Absolutely dead on too. You know <laughs> you. Mm-hmm. you before you just blind cast yes even, even with down imaging i mean down imaging is great but this 360 it's it's um and you can actually you know it updates as fat and you can speed up the update i've actually seen i actually have a video i could show you guys but not another time but a video you could actually see the fish and as it updates you can see them move mm-hmm. you know so it, it's not like mega live but if you learn it it's it's pretty damn good interesting yeah that's the reason actually my wife and i caught the fish we did in, in pre-practice on um chick. the chick because we were fishing uh the cypress trees when the water pulled out we saw that there were lay downs mm. actually like past where they were at and those were the next stopping point and so we were able to catch a couple there and practice doing that but if we didn't have that i wouldn't it's have, a whole new world yeah and it, and it lets you it lets you practice and fish at the same time that's why i tell people so when my brother and i would fish we would spend almost 24 hours in the water where it'd get dark, we'd idle. And and you could then structure scan and stuff. With 360, it was nice. You can still be fishing and you're still searching too. Yes. Mm. So you don't have to pick one or the other. Interesting. So I can be beating the bank and then like, oh, there's a log over there. I can waypoint that and come back to it or I can fish it right then. Crazy. That's the yeah, thing that's so pretty cool amazing. About it. Yeah. No, but yeah. And, and I never realized how much it, it benefited me on the river. Like I said, there's yeah. there's places that I found <clears throat> that I didn't, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually find fish on it too. Which is good to know because I think, you know, the old adage was, well, you've got your temp water temperature and, you know, other than that, you don't really need it. And, you know, maybe on the North Fork or South Fork, you know, you, where it's not as even less wide, but, you know, less area to fish. But no, that's interesting to know. Well, that- especially, like I said, 90% of the fish, 10% of the water. That's right. That ledge yes. is part of that 10%. And that's why, too, like when I, a lot of times when I write, you know, not not even knowing that, just knowing how important it is to fish bank to bank. And you may start off with, I'm going to, you know, stay in the, the current right now or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in this given place. Yep. But before you leave, don't be afraid to, and this goes any body of water, including lakes, right. come off of that bank and start fishing that deeper structure and try it because, because fish are swimmers back to what we said before. Yeah. And to your point, if you're watching them, and we don't think they're not walking around on two feet like we do. We even we move, but they not only can will move in an area here, but they're going to move up and down. Up and down. So they're swimming, yes. and that's where sometimes too. Again, we don't we don't stay up with them. No, I mean they, they're at, after two things. Well, three: cover, mm-hmm. love, and eat. <laughs> that's Pretty the simple. three things. I like it. You know what? So I. I <laughs> The time of year I fish, I know either I'm gonna focus on love, I'm gonna focus on food, or I'm gonna and always focus on cover. Yes, yes. that's Structure a t-shirt right there. No, yeah. that's that is yeah. that's about as simple as you can make it. But, yeah, but if you down, think about it though, no, that's dead on. You know, when these guys say, "Yeah, that fish traveled 20 miles," no, I don't think so. You know, when when like lake anna you you yes. keep or even the chickahominy when you take these fish and move them 10 15 miles they're not coming back okay in the river egypt <clears throat> bend i mean if you took one up the other end dropped it off it could make its way you know that's a yeah. couple miles yeah, yeah absolutely 15 20 miles not happening i just don't believe that yeah i mean is it possible well they've done studies they've yeah. tagged them and they've right. not gone that far right uh, what five miles is like the longest or something. But anyhow, if they travel, mm-hmm. it's for three things: love, structure, food. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It breaks yeah. it down. So with this, I, I want to get into the river. I want to talk about some other bodies of water too, Lake Frederick. Okay, that is a cruel mistress. Um, yes. What are your thoughts on that place? Uh, Lake, I've caught some big bass out of there. Uh, Lake Frederick. I think, you know, the size of it uh, hinders for the amount of pressure it gets. So, you know, uh, there's some nice bass in there, but I, I, I think, you know, over time, you're going to see those die off. Now, there's more bass, and it, it'll, since they're putting the Christmas trees and stuff in there, mm-hmm. 
big difference. They needed mm, that. You right. know, that that'll make a big difference. And I think there's grass growing. There's more grass growing back in it mm. now. So uh, having the the housing development, I don't know how much that'll affect it. Uh, years and years ago, it was, it was really good fishery. But you know, mm. it's like anything else. Uh, it gets a lot of pressure. Mm. The best time to fish Lake Frederick would be March. Love time, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they're starting to eat up, you know. Eat February, March. I mean, that's that's the best time to catch them. Mm -hmm. In uh, summertime, night. I mean, we a lot of guys don't night fish, but I fished there at nighttime before. Uh, it was uh, it was interesting. I mean, you could hear them, and I got smacked in the head with the frog, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, yeah. That's why I don't. It, 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 I, you know, Frederick, I like it, but it's one of those I like to hate. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's a tough, and that goes back to, I remember Brian fished it for a year or more before he ever really started figuring it out and, and actually having success. And so, um, and a lot of that took coming off the bank, getting off the bank, same thing, like, uh, fish. And, and again, there's still people, it is a hard finding that 20 to 30 foot range and being comfortable with, cause like right. you were saying before about cover, our eyes, we relate to that log or tree, you know, that we can see, um, now with technology, you can see it down even Well, deeper, and you've got but, a lot of people that are throwing bluegill and, mm -hmm. you know, when you start, when you start doing that, I mean. Obviously, that's going to be one of their main forks, mm -hmm. crappy and bluegill. Uh, but now I understand there's maybe some blueback herring or something in there. Somebody throw it in So, there. that's why we do this thing, isn't yeah. it? Uh, Halleker said that that they didn't stock it in right. there. Um, that somehow somebody else actually mm -hmm. dumped it in there, if they're actually in there mm -hmm. at all. I Rumors out on that. I think um, Jeremy Radford said he had a photo of something that he yeah. caught out of there. And we'll have uh, Greg Sanders. He's coming on. Uh, yeah. He'll he'll come on as well, and we'll have a chance to yeah, talk to him. Yeah, blueback herring get put in there. Yeah, it makes it difficult because you got to follow yeah. them. I yeah. mean, the, them them bass. I mean, that's like yeah. smorgasbord for them. Yeah, you know, and just like Lake Anna. Yeah. Uh, well, and two things. So, and I think you're talking about grass coming back. I mean, when that grass disappeared, when you take away grass, which is their buffet. Yes. Um. You take that away, and then you again you introduce something like that that they're going to be free roaming. Now they're fish to your eat concept. That in order to eat, you got to go move. Yeah, you they're going to go. chase them. I mean, you're going to have got to, to move. You're not going to be staying on that no. grass buffet. No, they're not eating grass, but they're no, eating everything. No, they'll follow them things but, around. Yeah, yeah. Like so it does. Puppy. So it changes. So we have to. And we're seeing the same thing of like holiday. You have to change the way you fish. If you don't change the way you fish, you're just going to be. And I think for. You know, people talk about Dead Sea and stuff, and that, although true, like that's that's there's a lot of truth because it why because it's harder to catch fish and people don't want to work at it, right? We want to be able to just go and throw along that log and, mm. and rip it out. And when it's not on that log anymore, I mean, again, there's still maybe, but when the when you're back before, you're saying when they're out, it, that challenges us to change right. our style of how we fish. It's, and, it's also hard when we don't have a lot of bodies of water. It's mm -hmm. the one thing going down to central Virginia and actually being down there, they're spoiled rotten. Where they yes, have like five water. or yes. six yeah. and they're not big lakes, but because you have five or six lakes, right. it spreads people out. Correct. And that's one thing I asked him like, well, how pressured do these things get? And it's like, well, if one's pressured, sub, one is not. Like, right. Not, not every single lake is pressured mm -hmm. on a Saturday mm -hmm. and they're all within five minutes of each other. Mm -hmm. and, and so that does help, help level it out here where you just have like frederick and okay we have holiday but that is private pay to yeah, play right it's just going to get the snot kicked out of well it. Right. And, and and social media you know mm -hmm. some guy gets on her yeah i caught an eight pounder guess what everybody's going to lake frederick now mm -hmm. because right. they all well, and, and i get it you know mm -hmm. uh that that's what makes it even more pressure mm -hmm. you know social media and they you know they they see a big pass come out of there so they're going to mm -hmm. try their luck you know mm -hmm. uh, again what i look at like fishing anywhere i fish i could you know we could throw the exact same bait and i'll catch fish or he'll catch fish mm -hmm. and i won't mm -hmm. and it's not because we're not throwing the exact same bait it's because we're doing something mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. and that's what's causing that's the reaction right. that's right yeah. that's exactly right that's even like what you're saying and they're following it and that's what's you watch these fish too that'll something drops down they see it they could be here they see it drop down in front of them they swim down to it 
and they're going to look at it. Yeah. Well, again, if and that's the thing too, and how fast you fish, and if they're looking at it, but you're just like, or you've already given up on. That's the other thing I've watched. Um, one of my partners this last tournament, you know, he he was queuing in and thinking whether well, we're getting bit way off, like he had to make a long cast, which can be true. But he also got hammered right at the boat. Mm-hmm. So how far did that fish travel? You know, and yeah, then, they then eventually it. take it. Yes. So I guess what I'm saying too, though, is if I'm dragging something, and if I sometimes too, you got to soak, you got to wait, you got to be patient, the do nothing technique, because what you don't realize is that fish has been watching. I'm, I don't realize it. I don't realize there's a fish right now nose on it. But if I'm, you know, bringing yeah. it in too fast, it's like that fish is gonna be like. Whereas if I just maybe drug it a little bit more, or just did this, just let it sit, then eventually that that's where that trigger that there's always gonna be a trigger. Where they're gonna and, and that was one of my worst enemies, you know. When Fishing I was young, I was like, yes. yeah, just flying down the yeah. bank, you know. But I, I've learned since I got older mm. yes. uh, that it's like you said, they'll go down, they'll look at it, yes. you know, and they, they they may look at it for thirty seconds That's or right. so, and then just make that one little twitch, and it's enough to, yep. and then they'll take it, it's you know. Good. But a lot of us we don't see that, so. It could be on the other way, up. too, a stop. If you're running something, it could be the stop. So it's, yes. it's following, following, following. As soon as it stops, it's got to make a decision, go now. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's like, take it now. And so sometimes, and that's what, back to the jackhammer I was thinking earlier, too. I don't know if all are true, but I've noticed that jackhammer will be running true. Then all of a sudden, every yes. so often, that thing, like, kicks mm-hmm. just a little it bit. Wanders. Now, you could also, I mean, you could, you know, vary that, too, with your own thing, but naturally that thing does that and sometimes i think that's too that's what why. makes it effective they're they're the vibration they're keen in on they're following it and then that gets that little thing is just you know they they uh, the big thing uh several years ago was getting crankbaits to mm. track yes you know yes. wow that that was causing more reaction mm. you know and the jackhammers it does naturally it does, does like what that. you said yeah. it, it'll be like that and all of a sudden it'll, it'll just it'll, yes. kinda, yeah and that just causes a reaction sometimes we'll, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. That is fascinating stuff, isn't it? And I, I actually caught a huge smallmouth on a, the Savage. You ever seen the Savage mm-hmm. Bluegill? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I was fishing with Ford. Mm-hmm. And I said, man, I'm going to throw this. It was muddy water. I said, I'm going to throw this out there. He said, you're not catching nothing. I said, man, how do you know? <laughs> I bet I didn't make two casts. Boom! I said, yep, I got one. <laughs> I mean, he inhaled it. Yeah. When they're on that bite, it's, yes. that's all elite. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm, I, and and I know that like when the perch are spawning, I'm going to target those right. beds because them bass, they'll set right off and just mm. wait, mm. you know. And I caught some good ones like mm-hmm. that. So speaking of baits, like I know you have a couple out in front of you right now. What what would you be throwing right now on the river? If I like, uh, and this right here, this and and you could take a child fishing. Anybody you want to take to the river, this bait right here, this color, is the absolute best bait on the river. Is that a fluke or is that a stick bait? It's a Yamamoto D shad. D shad, yeah. It's it's olive shad. Yeah. Hmm. Like here again, green back, mm-hmm. white bottom. You know, and that bait right there will so catch how you, you. How are you rigging it? Because I this I, is something too. I I'm getting it, back to right now. I actually like throw it on a spinning rod. Okay. And all my spinning rods are rigged with. Uh, 15 pound braid and i use fluorocarbon leaders and then i do not fish any weight no weight no weight okay. and i fish it uh text post weedless and the thing that's really nice about the ewg 3r is it is very salt impregnated it's a lot heavier than like yes. a zoom super fluke and that thing the action on that if you twitch it it mm-hmm. looks just like a dying minnow you Darting, know? Yeah. i yes. will tell you if you're pre-fishing it's just from my experience those are expensive yes <laughs> so you know uh make sure you get good life out of them uh because they're kind of like singos that thing maybe like what one or two per it's not like a last tech if you last. if you get uh four bass out of one you're doing good you're doing good yeah. okay J- yeah. just a it's, forewarning for people yes my wife she's like you buy them again because when i yeah. take people fishing mm-hmm. you know that i turn them on to that mm-hmm. and they say where you get them i said go to jake's bait mm-hmm. tackle mm-hmm. they got it <laughs> and as a matter of fact uh, there was mm-hmm. a guy a friend of mine he came down here a couple weeks ago and bought all mm-hmm. y'all had yeah so uh everybody i take i took my granddaughter uh here about a month ago and she she never her, her dad he, he catfished you mm-hmm. know so she never she wanted to go bass fishing. So 
I put that on. I had to teach her how to set the hook. Mm -hmm. But in in a matter of minutes, she was just ripping them. And folks, they you know they refer to this too as a soft jerk bait. And the, the other cool thing too, you can fish this also in all levels of water column. Yes. And that top water when you jerk it and it's tip in the top, like you were saying earlier, is when little fish are up feeding on those things. Absolutely. And you see that that big bass is going to come up. So from there down to the bottom but, but also what i love about these two is when you get into those brush piles what a great thing you're talking about too i always try to whenever i come up and see that sometimes i will pick this up and throw that in as opposed to maybe like a ned rig like you're saying uh because it is weedless and it can die it can die down right in the middle of that stuff and what does everybody always say i heard a guy say the other day they're you're less a lot of people are less apt to fish in that stuff because they don't want to get hung up and lose it right but if you present this right weedless, weedless it thing will get down into the dirtiest thing where they are mm -hmm. and you twitch it out that fish that's laying in behind there is yeah. now on it you so. can you can fish it on a bait caster and use 10 pound test you know mm -hmm. a lot of people worry about i use eight mm -hmm. six eight and when i fish it uh depending on what i'm throwing it in but if mm -hmm. i if i'm throwing it in brush or something like that i mean i'll horse it out if i lose it I lose it mm -hmm. but you can fish it on 10 pound test and, and still get the same reaction mm -hmm. and it's like you said you know if that when that thing falls mm -hmm. it they is, can't yeah. stand it, you know it's which just, is just, it's, the other thing i like to do is I, i've turned a guy yesterday on to mm -hmm. texas like you said but some of those hooks over there are too hot that has the ring on the end hitchhiker and well it's not a hitchhiker not screwed in it's just a regular but it has just a uh uh, not what I'm looking for, not a split shot, but, uh, screw lock? not the screw lock. It's just a regular ring, like, a, um, just a ring on the end of the, on the hook that you tie onto. And what mm -hmm. that does is that gives you oh, a okay, little yeah, bit yeah. more oh, I know Yeah. 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 Like yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it gives, gives it more action. A little action. bit more action. Yeah. Just, it's something small. And the other thing, you know, weightless, or if you wanted to do some weight, like I've been using a lot of nail weights insert yeah. in the belly too, which will give you a little bit of fall if you're fishing maybe deeper water. I mean, there's so many ways you could fish that, and and it, it just it's a phenomenal mm -hmm. bait. I, I, and again, I'm not sponsored by Yamamoto, mm -hmm. but those things right there, mm -hmm. I carry bulk mm -hmm. uh, because I know if I, especially on the river, that there's not I, any river I go to. If I'm floating in a kayak, I'm taking those mm -hmm. right there because yeah. that's a money. That's a great. Uh, what's yeah. another one you got there? Uh, a lot of people, you know, and, and it doesn't, I use Kayak. It doesn't have to. I think uh, the reason I'm using Kayak baits is because you can get like a 2.8. Most, mm. most of your forage, your bait fish forage in the rivers, you know, small. Mm. I mean, you start throwing big stuff. I mean, you'll get, but it's be like you with the glide bait. You yeah. know, you may get one bite all day. Mm -hmm. But these these Kytec on a small quarter ounce ball head mm. on the river, hmm. absolutely. And this color, you know, again, green, mm -hmm. white, is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, this on the river is, is, and and you could you could use these on the. Uh, the uh, swim bait hooks. Mm -hmm. It's got the hitchhikers, the small ones, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or like a slider rig, mm -hmm. and uh, they work really, really well. Mm -hmm. If uh, if it, they're more aggressive, then I'll throw these. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're not as aggressive, then then I'll mm -hmm. I'll mm -hmm. use these. Another and thing, Alana, you know, you start, keeps talking about, and for those who don't know too, that natural camouflage pattern of a dark color on top because if a fish is looking down in the water column the dark it's going to be darker down deep yes. if if a fish is up and you're looking up at the sky it's they're lighter they're yes. lighter on the bottom yep. darker on top for that well, camouflage I mean, to if try you, to protect if you look protection at, for the fish if you look at the forage in the river your mad toms are black on top mm -hmm. and they've got like yep. a brownish belly mm -hmm. uh your crawfish mm -hmm. they're, they're green pumpkin with yep. white on the bottom or yep. real light all your bait fish, mm -hmm. your 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 pumpkin seeds, mm -hmm. you know, all of them, they all are, are mm -hmm. built like that, you know. So I stick to as much natural yes. as possible, unless I'm flipping. Yes. If I'm flipping brush piles, then I go like the Bama bug or, yeah. or green pumpkin. Now, another thing, too, that I got to thinking about is um, when you're talking about two different colors or um, – yeah, like your reds or your uh, so certain fish. I've seen pictures of smallmouth too, 
at different angles with different lighting have a kind of a purple hue yeah. than how many like you look at a crap or bluegill all the different color if you really inspect a fish there's a lot of different colors in that fish and so you know sometimes that's the basic and then you can add different colors because i think when right. and you watch in the water too when a fish does turn a certain way yeah they got iridescent yeah you're kind of like you see it you may not yeah. see it here in the water but as soon as it turns or flashes you're you're it, you kind of see yes. it and i think the same thing kind of happened underwater too you know and that's that's oh, why yeah. sometimes I mean, to I, say color doesn't matter is not a true statement but you know, I, there I think, is, yeah, I think it matters to, mm -hmm. you know, because I like a, a little purple extent. in it too. I like yeah. purple, Anna, purple, mm -hmm. go to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but threadfin chad, they mm -hmm. have, they have that, uh, yes. purplish iridescent hue. Right. Yeah. And then of course they have a little, like a chartreuse line, mm -hmm. you know, yep. but, uh, in, in the river, I mean, you know, I stick to as much of the natural mm -hmm. as I can. Right. Uh, very seldom do I get wild with it, mm -hmm. you know. I don't go out un unless unless it's muddy, mm -hmm. muddy water, you know. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna throw some white and mm -hmm. pink and you know, chartreuse and mm -hmm. stuff like that. No, that's uh, I mean that keeps coming up. It comes up in here. I mean bubble gum for crying out loud, but yeah. bubble gum's a great color. You know, bubble you know, gum. So bubble gum was fire on a Potomac yeah. years ago, and, and everything changes. changes you know. Too, yeah. I, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, white zoom flew. Mm. There was the river that mm -hmm. if you didn't have that on the river, you mm. wouldn't catch them. Mm -hmm. You throw that now, I mean, you're going to catch some mm -hmm. fish, but I guarantee you, I'm going to take this and take your money. <laughs> guarantee. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So what's that last one you got there? The old mainstay tubes. Mm -hmm. Tubes. Uh, and like these here real heavily and in salt you could see like if you was to push on that the salt would poke up through them mm -hmm. like i was talking about but uh tubes like they they mimic your, your crawfish your your mad tom and even even bait fish you know it's just the erratic action mm -hmm. and i'll fish a tube i fish it a lot like with an ewg and mm -hmm. i'll peg a weight you know okay uh i that i could flip it you know, or drag it on the bottom or any, you know, fish it. And I don't have to, cause it's weedless. I, you know, like I fish that, it yeah. weedless. And, uh, that's a good to know. I yes. Thought, yeah. it, it actually works really, really well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I fished it. Now I look at the bottom. If I've got a lot of big rocks, you know, the, the open tube jigs, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like, uh, throwing those cause unless you've got, mm -hmm. well, I got tons of them, but, you'll lose them pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the time I'll fish this like Texas rig and uh, just, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't put a lot of weight on, you know, unless, unless I'm fishing a uh, heavy current or most of the time I stick to like an eighth ounce to 16th ounce. That's all I use. I'm glad he mentioned that. Cause that is another good way. Cause that's baits are one thing, lures are one thing, plastics. And then how do you rig it? And that's what we were talking earlier about trying to help customers you know do you have grass you're talking about the rocky bottom and then right. just trying to set customers up with the right hook that goes with that to make sure they have success and they're not getting hung up or losing it um but that that is another way that's yes that i like it. i need to keep that in mind. and it you know you can fish it anywhere and mm -hmm. in tubes like you say that any river around here even creeks mm -hmm. this is this is and you're mainly dragging them you said before yeah i drag them it, you know again it it depends mm -hmm. on the mood of the bass like if i'm fishing really really pressured like riverton mm -hmm. i'll drag it mm -hmm. but if i go to each of ben i'll stroke it you know pop it uh because i know you know, th they'll be a little more aggressive and how are you i want to throw out too because river has current and it's moving yes. like i think a lot of beginners um and everybody's different it's not that there's I always say there's no wrong way to fish now how are you let's take the tube how are you throwing are you throwing that up river and letting it swing down yes uh when you know especially depending on how fast the current mm -hmm. is you know i'll adjust my weight accordingly mm -hmm. uh you, you know, i always throw it up and mm -hmm. just let it just and i keep my rod just mm -hmm. about 11 o'clock, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm just letting it, just feeling it, you mm -hmm. know, and then it'll just kind of go along the bottom. Mm -hmm. And, but if you throw like the open hook to, 
Mm-hmm. You can do that, but uh, more than likely, eventually you're gonna mm-hmm. you're gonna break off. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but this way, it'll just it'll float on its own, mm-hmm. you know. And that and they and they key in on that. And what kind of uh, another thing we don't talk enough about again because we take for granted. I mean, if you fish this stuff, you know what the strike's going to be. And a guy also yesterday asked me, "What are you going to feel?" And I thought, well, that's a great question, you know. Because uh, a lot of times we don't uh, be any fishermen, or you try something new. What what are you feeling on the other end? What kind of and, you know? And, and I get this a lot when I take people fishing. You know, because they can't distinguish the difference yep. between rock and a strike, wood yep. and That's a strike. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what I always tell them is, listen, if you get a bite, all you're going to do is just raise your rod just a little bit mm-hmm. until you feel that pressure mm-hmm. and you feel that little head shake. Mm-hmm. Okay then set the hook you know a lot of people as soon as they feel something they want to say but it's Mm -hmm. not always a fish so Mm -hmm. i always tell them listen i know this is difficult but just just when you feel pressure just move your rod one two inches Mm -hmm. and if it feels a little heavy pull just a little more as soon as you feel a little resistance set the hook Mm -hmm. you know the best way i describe that to teach people is when i pre-fish for tournaments and you'd have to shake fish off mm-hmm. that is a damn good way to teach you like the difference between a bite and not a bite mm-hmm. it is impossible to shake fish off sometimes mm-hmm. like you'll no matter how hard you try want them. you know it's like even if you're trying to just pull it away from mm-hmm. them sometimes they won't even give it up no, yeah they want it and they'll come to the boat before they open their mouth yeah. and it really showed me the difference there like e- even if it's a light bite it, mm-hmm. you, you have more time than you think right. to, to set the hook right on. But until you start fishing tournaments and you and you specifically are trying to shake some fish off, you didn't mm-hmm. realize like I've been going about this all wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, and that's that's one of the hardest things, you know. And, and especially people beginners, you know, they just want to set the hook, and and it's really hard to get them to to just you know just ease into mm-hmm. it. You know, it, it it's going to work. You know, mm-hmm. but me, you know, of course I've been doing this for so long, I don't know anything else. But I can tell if it's a perch or it's a bass mm-hmm. you know and, and most mm-hmm. of the time that tick that you feel is right. them inhaling it yep. that's the tick you feel and i always tell everybody be a line watcher mm-hmm. if you see it just you see your line all of a sudden you see it jump well pretty much i can tell you that bass just sat there and sucked it in and sitting on it <laughs> or else he spit it back out that's right. i've seen them uh, i've seen a video where a bass actually inhaled a crankbait crank and spit that. it out with yeah. all those treble hooks you think about so, that amazing. yes i mean it it, it is me yeah and, but if you got if it's something they want and it don't have that foul taste or they keep it you know they're gonna hang on to it mm-hmm. and, and the longer they hang on to it the more apt they're about to swallow it mm-hmm. so you know there's a fine line that's yeah. awesome Sir, like, where can people follow you uh or if people want to get in contact actually with you? i don't have facebook anymore but uh i like I said, I'm, I'm thinking uh, Jason Boer and I mm-hmm. are planning on starting a guiding business, and mm-hmm. I want to teach fly fishing, cool. on water fly fishing and, and bass fishing. Uh, if anybody want to contact me, I would say contact through you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let us know if you're them. interested, and we'll get you in touch yeah. with Lonnie. Yep. Uh, I, it's been a pleasure. You know, like I said, I've been doing this for, I guess, 37 years, uh, and I just love to show people how to fish catch them you know and you talk about fly fishing so is that something you're doing predominantly on the river for smallmouth and bluegill or well i i will be able to take them uh on water either river or or trout fishing Mm -hmm. either way i have access to of course all the trout streams around Mm -hmm. here you know and and the biggest thing about fly fishing is reading the water Mm -hmm. you know understanding the water and uh then you know, it's really the last guy I just got done teaching. I had him catching fish in, in an hour. Yeah. And That's there's something awesome. about a river. Like you could start on a trout stream, and I'm not discouraging everybody from doing that. But the nice thing it's about difficult. a river, you got a lot more room and yes. you're going to catch a lot more fish and you, you can get so much better at it. Or a pond, you can do a farm pond too. Yeah. But. You know, and, and being on a boat, you, you know, one thing about fly fishing is the cast. Yes. You know, and, and so on a boat, Mm-hmm. you're out in the middle of the river so you mm-hmm. got you don't have to worry about the back yeah, cast yeah. yeah you know they can watch mm-hmm. it and the big thing about the loop and all yep, that yep. you know it's standing in the yard's one thing but standing on a boat or standing in a trout stream trying to do it mm-hmm. is totally different i mean it just takes time 
So, you know, one thing, uh, a conversation yesterday too, talking about young kids and how good they are at fishing and the access they have to, because of YouTube and information and knowledge, but they still have to take that out to a pond. Yeah. You know, listen yeah. to him talk about reading and that used to be back in the day. And I saw there's a DVD laying up over here. <laughs> You know, Jeff Little talked about DVDs, you know, producing those. But back in the day, you didn't have that technology. No. So you pretty much, like to your point, you read read up and then just through personal experience. And so I would just encourage people out there, again, you, you do have unlimited access to knowledge and information. But the cool thing about somebody like this that, and I'm hearing more and more Jeff Little did it, you know, he's wanting to do it and will do it, is taking advantage of people like this that will go with you and take you out there in the environment. And there's so much knowledge right here that, you know, they're willing to share it. So why not, you know, take advantage 100%. of that? Yeah, and, and, uh, and you can learn so much from somebody that's been on the river for over and, 40 and, years. You know, I don't fish a lot of terms, so I got nothing to hide. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't have secrets anymore. I mean, I have people actually call me all the time and say, Hey, I'm fishing here. Uh, what should I use? So, yeah. you know, I'm saying, yeah, use this, just this, this. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I give up my secrets. I don't yeah. care. But you, the best feeling in the world is watch a child catch yeah, and that's a something. fish, you know. That's cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, well yeah, sir, thank yeah. you so much for yes. coming on. I really Thanks appreciate it. Appreciate uh, it. Guys, link in the description to everything we talked about today. Also, when his guide service gets up and running, we'll have that. We're going to have to come back on the show to talk yeah. about fly fishing, too. Yeah, good stuff. If you're in the Winchester area, please stop by Jake's Bait and Tackle for all your needs. And then, guys, please like and subscribe down below. We are now the number one fastest growing uh, outdoor podcast and radio show in the greater Washington, D.C. area. So we'll see you next time of fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will